Hello there and welcome to our weekly webinar. I'm so happy to be here for our 2024 mid-year economic update with John Chang. If you have not heard him before, you are in for the biggest treat. He takes very complicated economic topics and boils them down. Now this is going to be uh, somewhat focused on commercial real estate because uh, John is a VP at Marcus and Millichap and their focus is on multifamily and um, self storage and industrial and retail and and so forth, but the overall view will be um, real estate in general and how the economy is doing and how these different asset classes will be affected. Uh, so I'm very much looking forward to it. Uh, Celia is working on getting John on. He is a very busy guy and just finished another webinar and is now coming on. Uh, so you might hear some voices in the background, but I wanted to make sure we got started. So welcome, so happy to have you here. I know we have a lot of first timers on this webinar, so I'm, I'm thrilled to have you here. So while we're waiting for John, I'll just go through a couple of slides. Again, I am Kathy Fetke. I am a co-founder of Real Wealth with my husband, Rich, uh, which we founded in 2003. Uh, so if you haven't been to our website, uh, this is what it looks like. It's realwealth.com. Uh, we pride ourselves on simplifying the process of investing in real estate. It can be so overwhelming. It was for us when we started over 20 years ago. I remember a friend of mine buying her first house and she kind of told me the process and it was like, oh, I'm never going to be able to do that. Uh, but it's a step-by-step -step process and it gets easier as you go. I'm sure we've got a lot of experienced investors, but for the newbies, I just uh, want you to know you're in good company. We've all been there at some point. Uh, but at Real Wealth, you know, it uh, started where Rich and I thought that we had to be wealthy first to invest in real estate. But when I started the Real Wealth show where I desperately wanted to interview people to give me insights on, uh, you know, on how they became wealthy, I learned about the power of leverage and, and that even on your first property, you only have to put three and a half percent down. And back then it was zero percent because it was the, the uh, crazy mortgage days. Uh, but uh, from that, I, you know, we put together a step by step process so that other people could understand how to get started. We're going to talk a little bit about why that's so important. There seems to be a trend in the government today. Uh, of too much spending, <laughs> so kind, of, kind of always has been, but it's really, really in, intense right now. And in fact, um, the only way to pay the debt and at least the interest on the debt is to create more money. And that's what we're seeing uh, kind of a pattern of this money creation that didn't used to exist 30 or 40 years ago. And as a result, that affects the asset assets out there because the more money it's like having a, a monopoly game where you know that there's a certain amount of apartments on the table and you know that there's a houses on the board and there's a box of money and everybody gets the same amount of money and uh, you're kind of competing to buy those houses right and then all of a sudden somebody bring the banker brings in another box of money and passes that out well now you have more money um, to try to bid on these properties and there's not that many of them on the board, right? It's not that easy to bring on new properties. It's easier to bring in new boxes of fake money. So that is a trend that we're seeing. And as a result, it's getting harder and harder to get into assets. But if you don't get in, it's gonna get harder. Um, we don't really see a change to that. I, I, I don't see one unless we went into a, a major depression. I, I don't see that either. Uh, but we're gonna talk about that again as soon as John gets here. Uh, go, I'll just kind of move on to the next slide to tell you anyone who's new to Real Wealth. Again, we've been around since 2003. You probably know my story. 2003 was the year that my husband was diagnosed with melanoma and told by the doctor that he probably had six months to live because back then they didn't really have a lot of the cancer treatments that they have today. It was pretty much a death sentence. Um, Rich is a big, strong guy. If you know him, you, you know what I'm talking about. He jumps off of bridges. He, he was in the X Games, um, uh, you know, on ESPN, bungee jumping. And um, so it was really shocking that a freckle, you know, could take this big man down. Um, so I refused to believe it. Instead, I focused all my energy on how I could um, help our family, how I could find ways to work at home so I could be there for my family during this challenging time. We had two young kids. 
And that's when I had the Real Wealth Show in San Francisco and just started interviewing people to find out how other people create this mysterious thing called passive income. I had no idea how to do it. I didn't know anyone who had it. Uh, so that is basically how it started. And um, I just recently did an interview with Robert Kiyosaki. It'll be our 1000th episode on the Real Wealth Show. And uh, on that interview, it's going to be coming out soon. I talk about how he came on the show back in 2005 and taught me how to invest out of state. Basically, he could see the mortgage meltdown coming because it was very obvious people were getting into these bad loans that were going to adjust and they wouldn't be able to afford the payments. So he showed me how to maneuver around the coming storm. It was He knew it was going to be a massive economic storm. He gave me techniques on how to stay out of the storm and stay in the quiet of it. And uh, Rich and I blew, got on a plane and went to Dallas where they didn't have so many crazy loans and still the, the home prices were in line with uh, salaries. Yet there was job growth, population growth and infrastructure growth. These are things I wanna see in a market. And uh, that's worked out very well. So we since have helped thousands, 77,000 investors at Real Wealth now. Uh, we've taught them how to invest out of state. We have teams out of state that have worked with our members, some for almost 15 years, with rave reviews. If they're on our website, that means that our members are happy. If they're not on our website, it means that maybe they're going through some issues that they need to solve. Sometimes companies, always companies have good times and bad times. So if they're starting to have issues with property management, we just sort of take them off the website for a bit until they work out their kinks and then come back on. So the people on our website that we refer our team to, our uh, members to, are just have rave reviews. We have, wow, oh, 78,000 members. I was saying 77, but it's growing quickly. Um, and 1.3 billion assets acquired by our Real Wealth members. Uh, we do believe that, you know, we're, you're never going to see me standing in front of a Ferrari pointing to it and saying you could be like me someday and have a Ferrari. For us, not that there's anything wrong with it. I, they're lovely cars. But it's really for us, Real Wealth is being able to have the time and the money to remove that anxiety of how am I gonna have enough money uh, to, to pay for the things that matter, for the kids' education, for my parents that are aging, for the vacations I'd love to take, to, to maybe quit this job I hate and do the one I want to do. Um, real wealth is really living the life you dream of, and it's not about material things, although lots of material things are fun to have too. But, um, you know, the idea is that assets will give us the passive income so that we're freed up to do, to have both the money and the time to live life the way we want to. Um, we have been blessed with the most incredible investment counselors. Uh, they, they are not um, just fill-ins, shall I say. These, these are sophisticated investors. They don't really have to work. They love speaking with our, um, with our members. Aristotle has been with us for so long, maybe 10 years. I, I'm not sure, but you know he buys in the markets that we promote with the teams that we work with. Um, Leah Collett, she is, she was a member of Real Wealth for many years. She is married to a, a military guy, so they're moving all the time and they, they can't do hands-on real estate. A lot of people think the only way to do real estate is buying a house, fixing it up and flipping it or burr, you know, or something like that. But there are people who just can't. If you're in the military and you're in Europe, you know, or like overseas somewhere, how are you possibly gonna do that? You're not. So Leah and her husband, Preston, had to figure out what we had to figure out, which is how do you do this more simply, more passively? How do you build this portfolio without doing the dirty work? And a lot of people just don't want to. We've got doctors, we've got professional athletes that, again, just can't be out there trying to, to fix up homes or manage properties. Um, so Leah was a member, bought a bunch of properties, and. Uh, we had her on a pan panel. We often have member panels so that people will share their stories. And everyone at Real Wealth is like, oh my gosh, she's so fabulous and knowledgeable. Um, we asked her afterwards, is there any way you're possibly looking for a job? And she actually said, well, sure, because she can do it remotely as they kind of live anywhere and all over the world. Um, she's been helping our members uh, now for many years and running that, running the Real Wealth Realty uh, part of our business. So. Just you're in such good hands. Joe Torrey has also been with us, I want to say almost 10 years, maybe maybe more. 
Um, he came from the Silicon Valley working in the tech industry and um, also was a member. And also we reached out and said, you're so wonderful. Can you, you know, <laughs> you looking for a job? And he already had a job, but um, you know, he was more interested in real estate. So he has been helping our members um, also a, a military guy. And uh, so a lot of our members love that. Uh, these, these people are available to our real wealth members. You, you just join go to realwealth.com, you join, and um, you will have access to the different teams that we work with. But if you're new to real estate, we very much prefer that before you speak with our teams, uh, the property teams around the country, that you you know speak with our investment counselors first so that you have a really clear um, you know, uh, strategy before you get started. We really want to reserve questions um, you know what we don't want to overwhelm our property teams because we want them out there finding good properties fixing them up making them great getting them managed under under management so the basic real estate investment questions we'd really prefer you bring to us uh, we are licensed we are a licensed real estate brokerage and licensed in california uh, so we act as a referral broker because we're not licensed in the places where we like to invest texas florida tennessee um, Oh my gosh, Charlotte is one of the hottest markets now. Uh, Indianapolis, you know, we're not licensed in all these places. We're licensed in California. That's where we're based. So our business model is to find really great brokers and property teams in other markets and refer you to them. And, uh, and that is how it works. So we just receive a referral fee uh, like a real estate agent would. But I, I'll just kind of go on to say that this is these are the markets that we are really focused on at Real Wealth. We're going to talk a little bit about why uh, these areas have been really outperforming. Uh, I think, you know, it's no, it's no secret anymore. Um, Texas, Florida, we have just so many businesses every day moving to these areas because they are business friendly. Um, at Real Wealth, we have been focusing on business friendly markets since the beginning because these are, uh, you know, some of the things that we, we learned in those early interviews that I did on the Real Wealth show. It's like, do business in areas where they want your business where um, you're not treated like a pariah, where you're the bad guy. And, you know, I don't want to pick on certain states, but, um, you know, real estate investors are providing a very important service. And uh, that service is providing housing for many people or storage or, um, you know, industrial space. And, uh, but particularly in housing, uh, oftentimes investors are uh, treated as if they're the ones that set the, the, the rental rates and really it's it's not like that it's uh, we you know we got to make the numbers work or we're not going to be able to, we're not going to buy properties just to be negative cash flow although lots of people do in California <laughs> <laughs> well California has long been an appreciation play yeah yep you know you you could you can handle a little negative uh, you know negative cash flow if you're going to make a few hundred thousand you know it's funny you say that John because the very first um, property that rich and i invested or our home but we turned it into a fourplex kind of did a house hack they say lived in part of it rented out the other part it was outside of san francisco in lafayette we paid five hundred and forty thousand dollars for this massive six-bedroom house that we again we turned into a fourplex every year that property went up a hundred thousand dollars after 10 years we made a million bucks on it and um, you know that's, that's california for you but it it, uh, it took renting out three rooms to make it work. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, yeah. Well, especially the Bay Area, and 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 I am hearing that the, you know we are seeing uh, you know a little bit of a resurgence in the uh, in the Bay Area. It was pretty soft over the last couple of years, but it looks like it's turning around. Yeah, that's interesting. So um, while we're waiting for the slides, what? Why do you say that? What's what's happening? Because most of the things that I'm seeing are are showing more and more of an exodus from California, both from businesses and, and residents. But what's the comeback that you're seeing? Well, first of all, the exodus is tapered off. Um, so we're using a different data source than, than most people. We're using, uh, it's called Placer AI. And what it's tracking is people's cell phones. And uh, in general, and it's, you know, we're, not, we're not, you know, tracking you know betty sue's cell phone we're tracking in aggregate and um so what's happened is during the pandemic and after the pandemic we saw this wave of exodus out of california uh, but it's really flattened out 
Um, we saw the same thing with the exodus out of the Northeast going to Florida, uh, and that's also flattened out. And the the methodology is is they basically are tracking where a phone stops moving at night and for how long. And after it's been at a certain destination for a certain amount of time, it triggers on their system and counts it as that is the home for that phone. And so we saw the big movement. It has stopped. The, with regard to the Bay Area specifically, it is the the AI renaissance. You know, it's it's um, what's happening with the AI technology, uh, with NVIDIA and some of these other uh, Google uh, and and so on. That they're repopulating and regrowing uh, in that core area uh and that's going to drive that next wave of growth uh in the silicon valley we're seeing a movement away from the work from home concept yeah. uh, a lot of these companies are starting to pull their employees back into the office and they're saying great you can live wherever you want but you better be in the office and um yeah. you know if, if you're not then you know we'll find somebody else and right. and so that's driving that recovery in the bay area Oh, It'll take awesome. time. It's not. It's not there yet, but uh, you know, home prices have started to uh, shift gears again, uh, and they're and they're starting to drift up again in the Bay Area. Well, and rents too. Rents are not keeping up yet. Uh, still a little soft, but it, okay. it's on a submarket by submarket basis. I think uh, I have to take a peek, but if you go to uh, San Jose. Let me take a peek. Yeah, it looks like rents are pushing back up in San Jose. Um, yeah, you know, I'm I'm born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area, and there's there's ups and there's downs, but in the end, it seems to always go up. Um, you know, yeah. Anything can change, but it's still California. <laughs> still perfect weather. Yeah, well, the, the the technology infrastructure in the Bay Area is truly unique, right? And and yeah. uh, and so its ability to attract and retain that high income, uh, uh, you know, technology uh, sector uh, personnel is 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 pretty good. Um, uh, just looking at again, San Jose rents peaked in third quarter of 2022, and they fell. But they turned around and now they are basically back in alignment with with their twenty their twenty twenty two peak. So they came down and now they they've started to rise back up and they're they're back to where they started as of the second quarter data that we just got. Well, it, it's fascinating because you know we've seen so many tech companies migrate to Austin, you know, Nashville, Salt Lake, um, Seattle, obviously. Uh, and the belief has been that the Bay Area will weaken that way in terms of you know tech power, but you're saying that's not necessarily happening. It did, and we saw it. We saw the migration, especially to Austin. But it's it's uh, it looks like you know it's it's turning around. You have um, again, you have Nvidia. You have this AI renaissance, which is really centered in the Bay Area. You know, a lot of stuff can be moved to Austin or Seattle, uh, but but you know, when it comes to the core capabilities in the in the leading edge leading edge technologies, the Bay Area has has the all of the people that are driving the know how, and so that's why they're they're staying at the forefront there. Yeah. So yeah, the big, big it goes up and down, right? We saw this with the 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 dot com. Right, you know, where it just surged and then it it fell like a rock and then and then it recovered again, and yeah. you know at the end of the day you have a concentration of knowledge there that you just don't have anywhere else. Um, so that that's the the turnaround story of the Bay Area. Like I said, we're not there yet; it's still in process, but we're seeing it turn the corner a little bit, along so with everything I, else I in commercial real estate. Maybe what you're saying is don't sell your house quite yet if you're if you own the Bay Area. Well, you know, you, you know, if you still have a place there, yeah, I would, I would, uh, I, you know, again, it's one of those unique things. How many people can afford a median priced home for two million dollars? It's right. it's just it's insane. So I I just 
in my mind, I'm like, well, geez, you know, really, how much more is it going to go up on a percentage basis? What's your return on equity relative to other markets? There are other markets that may see faster acceleration. Uh, so it might make sense to move capital. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I, I don't think it's I don't think it's going to go down. I, I think it, it, it will start to push up again. But again, moving in order to go up 10 percent has to go up two hundred thousand dollars, whereas in you know a market where the median price is, you know, five hundred thousand, it only has to move 50. So there, there is a relational difference there. OK, I was going to say, like, obviously, Austin has been the beneficiary of so much of the my out migration um do you see that continuing or those companies going back to the bay uh, you know i i think austin has had a critical mass I, I mean really if you were to line up the top technology markets in the country uh you know austin's in the top three uh, along with seattle and the and then the bay area conjointly and so austin i don't think you're going to see any loss but I think the pace of growth may taper a little bit. Uh, but again, you have a critical mass there. It, it is its own entity when it comes to the the technology and the employment in the technology sector and the opportunities that's creating. The challenge you have with Austin, though, is the is the development cycle there. I mean, talk about complete difference from the Bay Area, right? The Bay Area yeah. is supply constrained. Uh, it, it hit a real soft patch, and and now it looks like it's going to come out of that soft patch. But regardless, nobody can add new inventory in the Bay Area. It's very difficult to do. Whereas Austin, uh, in 2024, we got what 25,000, almost 26,000 new units coming online in Austin. That's an eight and a half percent inventory growth. That is enormous. That's the, the biggest inventory growth in the country, and it is it is definitely going to uh, take a while to absorb those units. Will they do it? I believe they will, because the the market itself is strong there is momentum there is job creation uh and, you know all of those indicators are pointing in the right direction it's just not um uh you just got an oversupply over the short term uh, i think austin has a critical mass that's going to be able to carry it forward especially you know you 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 hear the stories of elon musk talking about moving uh spacex over into texas i don't know if he goes to austin where he put where he put you know his tesla operations in that area so we'll see. We'll see how that plays out. But ultimately, Austin is a great market. It, it just has an oversupply issue over the short term. Yeah, yeah, I would I would think so. Okay, we got your slides up, but I do have one more question. We, sure. um, San Antonio is one of our members' favorite markets. Uh, we've had um, the most sales, the most people want to know about our team there. Uh, we have the most referrals to the San Antonio area. And um, and I had a demographer on the Real Well Show saying that uh, that whole San Antonio area is one is the fastest growing in the nation. Do you agree with that? San Antonio is. Um, I don't know how to characterize this. It, it, it it's a little bit weird right now, right? Because the vacancy <laughs> rate there is high. Right, so okay. we're showing that San Antonio has a vacancy rate of 8.8 percent. It's a, it's elevated relative to historical trends. A vacancy rate and what else class? Uh, this is multifamily. Multifamily. And okay. and so you look at it on the surface, and it looks a little bit soft, but it is still one of my favorite markets in the country over the long term, and the reason is because of the supply chain changes that were brought on by the by the pandemic when we were going through the the pandemic and as the supply chains broke down uh with china and as tariffs were placed on chinese imports uh we really have seen a shift uh in how companies are looking at the manufacturing process and so they are saying well I guess the best way to show it is what happened with uh, container shipping 
So before the pandemic, to move a 20-foot container from China to Long Beach uh, cost about $1,400 uh, per container. And then at the height of, of the pandemic cycle in September 2021, that, that cost to move that container was over $19,000. It was up more than 10 times what it was before the pandemic. And, you know, since then it's come back down. But what it demonstrated to businesses, to companies, was that that supply chain was not reliable, that there were right. things that can break that supply chain. And on top of that, labor costs in China have gone up significantly over the years. And relative to Mexico, the cost of labor in China is higher. And so it's a real it's a real expensive thing to move a manufacturing plant, right? So to shut down yeah. a manufacturing plant in China and open a new one somewhere else is very very expensive, and companies haven't wanted to do that. But they found that over the pandemic that that was uh, something that they really needed to consider. And most companies are looking at nearshoring or reshoring opportunities where they bring that manufacturing back from Asia and bring it back into either the U.S., Canada, or Mexico where you're not dependent on a, on a container ship uh, and you're not reliant upon whether or not the port of Shanghai is open. You're not incurring all those same tariffs on the movement of goods. Yeah. And Monterey, Mexico has emerged as a top candidate for these manufacturing facilities. And so there is a, a huge wave of growth happening in Monterey, Mexico, which is just uh, just a couple hours south of San Antonio. And so we're seeing this, this growth of manufacturing done in the Monterey market in uh, Mexico. And that is ultimately going to shift those supply chains and that manufacturing and the movement of goods. And San Antonio is going to be ground zero on the movement of that product coming in from Mexico. Uh, Houston will also benefit. Uh, some of this will go by ship and it'll come into Houston. But San Antonio gets that overland transit and is going to be a real hot market as we go forward. Now, this is, this is a big change. This takes years. This mm -hmm. is, you know, we're looking five, ten years forward. But I envision that that is going to be a really big driver for San Antonio. I think that the uh, elevated vacancy rates uh, right now uh, are are going to come, start to come back down as this trend materializes and takes hold. Uh, and again, one of the biggest challenges with San Antonio specifically is getting to a critical mass of operations. Uh, it, it's just a small market. So trying to get enough units there to make, uh, you know, uh, uh, management, uh, professional management makes sense could be a challenge for some investors. For smaller investors, especially someone who's in that local area, uh, I think this is a real uh, opportunity. Yeah, well, I'm so glad you said that because we're about to do a bunch of build to rent communities. Uh, we'll be coming out with that in about a month, tied up some land. And in, in one of those areas in San Antonio that's just booming. So good, 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 good. Love to hear it. Okay, I've got your <laughs> slides up. I've got your slides up. And so for those of you who've waited so patiently and listened to us banter, I hope you got value out of that. Um, John Chang, again, is Senior Vice President, National Director of Marcus and Millichap. If you have not been to their website, I highly recommend you do because it he he gives very frequent updates and they are so good. So we're just really just thank you for being here. John, how much time do you have? Because uh, this is supposed to go till two, but um, we're either going to have to rush through this or we go a few minutes over. What's your schedule like? No, no, I, I actually uh, I'm I'm good. We'll we'll take as long as okay. we need. Okay, okay, wonderful. All right, so we're gonna just um, we're on the next we're on the first of your slides. It says soft landing question mark. Leading economists still predict growth in 2024 and 2025. Yeah, the 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 key thing here is that first of all, there's a lot of people who think that the U.S. is in a recession. It is not. We are no, generating awesome. we're generating good uh, GDP growth. Uh, in fact, new numbers just came out today. They were stronger than anyone thought would come out. They'll probably be revised lower over time. But the key thing here is that the consensus, this is a blue chip consensus uh, forecast for the U.S. economy. Uh, it is still at 2.3% for 2024. 
Uh, when you look at where different organizations, you know, Goldman Sachs is saying, hey, it's going to be even higher than that. It's going to be 2.6 percent. Oxford Economics, another group of fantastic economists, they're at 2.5 percent. When you look at the consensus forecast from blue chip economists, uh, it was rising all through last year, uh, but it really has stabilized right in that 2.3 percent range for 2024. And the consensus forecast looking forward into 2025 is 1.8%. So basically, the economists are all saying, hey, look, Things are looking pretty good from an economic standpoint. Uh, it's you know it's it's tapering a little bit as we go forward, but that is by design. That is what the Federal Reserve is trying to do. Yeah. And so I think that we're looking pretty good. So in a nutshell, this, you know this slide is really just saying, hey, look, the economy is sound. Two and a half percent growth is pretty good. That is rock solid growth rate. It's going to slow down a little bit next year, according to these economists. Uh, and uh, but uh, it's still in positive territory. Yeah, just the, for those unfamiliar with, um, you know, what's normal. What what would be considered just a normal GDP in a non -pan after pandemic world? Well, <laughs> I, I mean. It, 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 it's hard to characterize it as normal, but if you look down there on the bottom right of the graph, it says annual GDP, and you can see where those numbers are. Most of yeah. them are right in that two to two and a half percent range uh, over the last 15 years. So it's really that is what I would consider to be uh, a target. The you know the the if the economy U.S. economy grows by two to two and a half percent each year, that is fantastic. The U.S. economy is the biggest economy in the world, and two, you know, two percent growth on on the size of this economy is is bigger it's than you know. It's like the entire size of the Canadian economy. That's how much we're growing each year. So, wow. um, I think it's uh, actually Canada. It would be it would take two years to rebuild the Canadian economy of the U.S. at a two percent growth rate, something like that. So, anyway, it's really. Fantastic growth. If we hit 2%, everybody's going to be happy forever. Okay, let's, let's, let's be happy forever. I like the sound of that. Okay. Um, didn't move to the next slide. Let me try again. Well, the next slide is going to be about jobs. Basically, the Federal Reserve... When inflation went up, the Federal Reserve was focused on getting inflation down. But the Federal Reserve has what's called a dual mandate. They have they have to keep inflation in check while maximizing employment, right? Trying to create as many jobs as possible. And so when inflation started to hit, they raised the interest rates, and that puts the brakes on job creation, or it tends to slow job creation down. And we see that uh, happening through the, this graph where uh, whether you look at it on a month-to-month -month basis, which are the bars here, or you look at it on a year-to-year -year basis, it's still this kind of a stair step down until we get to 2024, and then it kind of flattens out. Uh, and in the first quarter, we were doing about 267,000 jobs in the first quarter on a monthly average. Second quarter is 177,000 jobs per, per month. So we are seeing that tapering of employment growth that the Fed is trying to achieve. Now, they want – you know, before, you know, two years ago when they started raising rates, you know, they're like, well, if we hit a recession, we hit a recession. Too bad. We're going to have to get this inflation down. Now they're really focused on this soft landing. That is their their main scenario. That's what they're aiming at. So they want job creation and all of the other metrics to get very close to zero without pushing into negative territory. And that's what we're seeing with the employment growth is it's flattening out. It's moving into a smaller, smaller numbers without getting into negative territory. Now, the other challenge, though, is that the unemployment rate is starting to creep up. We're at 4.1 percent as of June the July reading comes out on August 2nd, the Friday, the first Friday of August, which just so happens to be two days after the Federal Reserve makes their next uh, has their next meeting, has their next rate uh, adjustment decision. And the reason this is so significant is because it's very close to the edge of what's called the SOM rule, S A H M, and is basically the SOM rule says. If 
the average vacancy rate over the last three months is 50 basis points higher than the lowest unemployment rate over the last 12 months prior, then, then you're going into a recession. And right now, if you take that trailing three months and compare it to the lowest rate over the prior 12 months, uh, the, it's 43 basis points, right? 50 is your trigger. If it goes up 10 more basis points, it goes to 4.2 for the July reading, it reaches 50. And so technically, that is another signal that we are going into a recession. And that's why the Federal Reserve has started changing their language when they meet with Congress, when they're out on a press tour or whatever, they're, when they're on TV or whatever. They're starting to say, yes, we are probably going to cut rates. So they don't even say that. They say the probability of a rate cut is increasingly likely or some, some nebulous statement like that. But basically, they're changing their tune. And the reason is because they have a dual mandate. They have to get inflation down. At the same time, they're creating jobs. And, and that unemployment rate trigger is very close to something uh, that is a warning sign, and they want to uh, you know, be very cautious of that. They're really close to the edge right now. They are still looking at a soft landing, but if they hold rates too long, they could squeeze the life out of that growth cycle, and, and that would be problematic. So uh, that's why we're, you know, basically Wall Street is saying 100%, we're going to see a rate cut in September. Uh, and they're all saying pretty much uh, no rate cut in July, uh, but the consensus is, is that we're going to see rate cuts as we go forward. A key piece of that is what's happening with that unemployment rate. But again, I want to uh, jump actually to continue into the next slide, which is economic slowdown or soft landing. Um, Basically, I throw in some other metrics here, which is the ISM Services Index, which is a major index tracking the service sector, uh, and that has a reading of 49. Now, the break-even point on both ISM services and ISM manufacturing is 50. If you're above 50, you're, the economy is growing. If it's below 50, the economy is shrinking, and it is a, a degree of magnitude. So 49 for ISM services means it is barely contractionary. It's shrinking just a little bit. And ISM Manufacturing Index also has a 49, and so it's also barely shrinking. That is exactly where the Fed wants those numbers. That is exactly spot on because they want things to slow down, but they don't want it to slow down too much, just a little bit more. When you look at inflation-adjusted retail sales, it's up 1.3% on an inflation-adjusted basis. So in real dollars, it is growing, again, by just a little bit. And when you look at the savings, the total dollar savings is uh, we saw it shoot up during the pandemic and then it kind of peaked and then people burned off. They spent a lot of that money. I include money market mutual funds, uh, money market funds in addition to sa actual savings deposits because so much of the money has moved into CDs where you get a higher yield. Uh, so whether it's personal or corporations, a lot of people have dropped their money into CDs and other money market funds. So I include that here. And when you add the savings plus money market, it's up to uh, basically move back into alignment with the long-term trend, uh, which is a positive. Basically, we have a lot of money that's still out there. So that I consider that to be dry powder for the economy. So right now, there's a little bit of caution. We see all those metrics that are shrinking. They're showing a very, very modest contraction and slowdown, but that is exactly what the Fed was hoping for. And, and so, uh, again, this reiterates the idea that the Fed will be ready to start reducing rates come September. Next slide is inflation moving towards Fed target. Yeah. So when you look at that inflation, you see how that peak and valleys. I have two different metrics here. One is CPI. That's the headline number everybody sees. And then the other one is core PCE, which is what the Fed is really looking at. Uh, personal consumption, expenditures, less gas and, and, and food. So core PCE has been moving down pretty steadily. We just got some new numbers coming in, but it's it's basically at two and a half percent. 
Core PCE is the number the Fed talks about when they say they want inflation at 2%. They're talking about core PCE, not the headline CPI number, not the consumer price index number. So basically, we see that core PCE drifting lower. It's at 2.5%. And and it's like steering a battleship, right? You're not going to be able to turn it on a dime. So they want to coast into that 2% number. It looks like we're on the right trajectory to get there. Uh, so that makes, again, that makes those rate cuts uh, have an increased probability. If you look at the CPI number, the, the consumer price index, you see in the beginning of 2024, it shot up very briefly and then started coming back down again at the end of last year everybody was talking about rate cuts we were all aiming you know at three four five seven ten whatever the number was everybody came up with their own idea everybody was saying we we're going to have rate cuts this year uh and but in the first quarter that cpi number started to bubble up and it gave the federal reserve uh, pause. They, 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 their caution level triggered, and they said, "Well, you know what? We're going to put this on hold. We're not going to, we're not going to cut rates. We don't know when we will. Uh, we're putting that whole plan on hold until we see the numbers coming down again." The good news is they're coming down again. Uh, the bad news is that it ruined my prediction of a June rate cut. Um, and so now it looks like the first cut will be September, which is where I thought we would have the second rate cut for the year. But um, so inflation is coming down. It is clearly showing a trend. Personally, I actually do believe that the Fed is – acting too slowly. I think they, they they should have started cutting rates already. There are a lot of top economists who, who have had expressed similar views, uh, including Mark Zandi and, and several others. But in a nutshell, uh, they're moving a little bit late. And as a result, um, you know, they're, they're, they're skating along the edge of the ice here that, that could uh, force them to start cutting rates more quickly at some point in the future. That seems to be the, the case too often. Well, I, I, I liken it to oversteering. Basically, they yeah. they started raising rates too late, so then they had to swerve and 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 steer way uh, uh, very aggressively to move those rates up, and and it ran a shock through the economy. The commercial real estate, residential real estate, uh, most sectors of the economy responded to that, and they were just steering really, really aggressively to push those rates up. And rather than easing back down, they look like they're they're moving a little too late again, and they may be forced into an oversteering situation again. Oh, brother! Well, especially when uh, other ba uh, central banks have already started cutting. Uh, I don't understand why. Canada. They have, yeah. Can't, yeah. So, um, so actually, that brings us to the next slide, uh, and basically. Uh, we use uh, something that's called FedWatch. Uh, basically, FedWatch is saying, yeah, pretty much a slam dunk. We're going to see a 25 basis point rate reduction in September. Uh, and and pretty much they baked in a uh, that rates will be f uh, the Fed will reduce rates by 50 to 75 basis points by the end of the year. And And again, that wouldn't – there's only – so we have the July 31st meeting, which – Pretty much everyone thinks that there will be there will be no rate cut there. Then there's September 18th. Pretty much everybody believes there will be one rate cut for 25 basis points at September 18th. The next meeting after that is November 7th, which is literally two days after the election. Most believe that there will not be a rate cut on November 7th, unless something's going completely awry with the economy and, and uh, we see it stalling out, uh, in which case the Fed might step in at that point. But the consensus is, is that the rate cut after that would be December 18th, and it would be 25 or 50 basis points, depending on how things are looking. Specifically, I would be looking at the unemployment rate and what's happening with that number. Okay. All right. So let's um, talk about the distress in the commercial real estate. We're constantly hearing about banks <laughs> on the edge of failing. So where, what's the truth? You know, literally just weeks ago, 
Uh, this, this article came out. Actually, it was July 12th. It's the one right in the middle. Multifamily distress nearly triples in six months. Right. So so I got an email from somebody and, and actually I'm posting uh, a video about this next week on, on my LinkedIn and on MarkSmillChap.com where I talk about this specific, very specific thing. Uh, and and I get emails. People are like, hey, wait, what's going on the market? Why is multifamily distress tripling? This is is this is this, you know, uh, some investors say, hey, this is this is this the opportunity of a lifetime? I'm going to go grab up a whole bunch of stuff at a discount. And some of them are saying, hey, wait a second. This is really bad news. Uh, but if you look at it, you know, fast company, commercial real estate foreclosures spike 117 percent and multifamily distress could head for a real estate Armageddon. They like that word Armageddon. Yeah, they're committed to having you not sleep at night. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're just trying to scare the crap out of people. And the thing is, is that, you know, why? Because it's the media. And they they generate income by, by having people click on these links and, and go read the story. And then even when you drill into it, it's really hard to discern exactly what – they're looking at and and specifically again when i got this email about multifamily distress tripling uh it basically uh i went and looked at the data that company was using it's it's uh, it's called uh real iq uh and when you look at the numbers it went uh, the distress level, and they include a whole bunch of different things baked into that distress. Again, I have this in my video. It'll be out Monday if anybody's really interested in this and what and cutting this apart. But basically, they include even performing debt that is in special servicing. It got into special servicing somehow, uh, but it's performing. And and they include that as distressed. They include a loan that is going through some sort of a workout or a renegotiation. If it has technically matured, but it is still being paid and they're still in negotiation with the bank, they're counting that as distress. Uh, if it's matured and they it's not performing, then it's included. I mean, they they bake a lot of stuff into this. So. That's the first issue. And the second issue is that their numbers historically are pretty volatile uh, on a month-to-month -month basis. And they're saying, hey, it went up from January when I think the number was 2.4%, uh, which is basically a record low level of distress uh, based on their parameters. And it went up to, I think, 7.5%. So they say, hey, look, it went up so much, but it's, um, but it's from, let's see, 2.6, I just grabbed the numbers, 2.6 to 7.4%. Uh, and 7.4% isn't even that high. But they're focusing that headline on the shocking news. And so when you look at the overall uh, climate of debt, debt maturities, foreclosures, you and you start digging into the, the hard numbers, it's not nearly at the scale that you see in the media. Um, just stepping through the, the slides in this section, I say it's a next one. And many loans scheduled to mature in 2023 have been extended. Basically, the orange part of each of these maturities by year uh, is is uh, stuff that was moved from 23 to 24 or was originated in 23. A deal that was written in 2023. This is new debt uh, with a maturity date somewhere in the future. And uh, But the majority of the orange part of the bar in 2024 was actually a rollover of something that was supposed to mature last year. The FDIC and the Federal Reserve got together and said, hey, what are we going to do? And they said, you know, let's let people extend if the bank wants to extend, especially performing debt. Uh, let's let them do that. And, and we saw that happening as we were going forward uh, through the last couple of years, actually. The thing is, is that we're starting to transition out of that phase, especially multifamily. You know, if, if we're talking about a performing office building, the bank wants nothing to do with it. They're going to let you extend that. And, and as long as you keep paying the bills, they're, they're good. They don't want to foreclose on an office building right now. They don't want to touch it. They don't want anything to do with it. 
But a multifamily property, I am hearing about some banks are starting to uh, foreclose on those and actually even operate those properties uh, because they believe that the market's going to shift and turn and those property values are going to rise. So uh, when you look at performing assets in stronger property classes like apartments, like uh, industrial, like medical office, and a few others, hotels to a degree, uh, retail, those are generally going to be actually more at risk of of a of a foreclosure situation or uh, or where the bank will sell the note off to somebody else who will foreclose than say an office building. Because, again, nobody wants to deal with office right now. But what the banks are also doing is there anything that they think is going to really non-perform, they think it's a real risk. A lot of the banks are trying to sell those notes off. Uh, they're going out the back door. They're going to select buyers that they know, and they're saying, hey, if you want to buy this, we'll buy it. You know, we'll, we'll discount this debt, and we'll sell it to you uh, at a discount because the bank really doesn't want it on their balance sheet. And we saw from what happened with Silicon Valley Bank, with what happened with First Republic Bank, that even a hint that your bank is at risk uh, can be all it takes to cause a run on the bank that ultimately puts them out of business. So they're being the banks are being very cautious in terms of how they're handling the bad debt or the at-risk debt. And we're also seeing a lot more caution in terms of how they've been lending on real estate over the last two years. Uh, that caution level has been uh, tremendously elevated, uh, and it's tightened up the capital markets pretty significantly. So uh, that's what's happening with the, the debt. Again, the headlines, if you look at the next slide with the, with the two pie charts there, um, banking risk. Again, the media kept talking about how oh, real estate's going to knock banks out of business. This is this is again something that's completely overstated. Only 24% of the banks' lending is going into commercial real estate. Most commercial real estate property types are performing; uh, they're doing just fine. Thank you. The one really problem child is office, and it's not even all office. It's really old, as in, as in uh, built in the 1980s urban uh, and large office towers. So if it's a large 1980s built office tower in downtown San Francisco or Chicago or some other major metro, that is at higher risk. When you look at other office buildings like a smaller, newer suburban office building, they're actually performing pretty well. Uh, so the the overall risk profile the the foreclosure risk in commercial real estate has been overstated the threat to the banking institutions again i believe has been overstated i think you're really just not going to see as much as people thought there is a ton of capital waiting on the sidelines you know waiting for all of this this uh foreclosure uh, to to happen and and for these problem child properties to come out, and I think that capital is going to be disappointed. Uh, there is a little bit, uh, and again, I think uh, Kathy, when we were talking last time, I think in April, and you know, I said said there, if you, if you're waiting for distress, okay, you're going to be owning office buildings because that's the only property type that really has anything substantial shaking free on that side of the uh, of the equation. So. Uh, Great clarification. Want, uh, yeah, so we go to the, the distress, uh, US, uh, US CRE distress. Again, the left side here, I have TREP, which measures CMBS. I have Cred I, IQ. Let me stop you there just for people who don't know. CRE is commercial real estate, CMBS, commercial back security, mortgage back securities, and what TREP is, what, what is TREP? TREP is a is a data vendor that tracks commercial mortgage backed securities debt, CMBS debt. Uh, CMBS debt has certain advantages, certain disadvantages, but generally speaking, especially multifamily doesn't use much CMBS. But it is it tends to be non recourse. There's some some advantages to it where it's very niche, uh, and there are certain property types where they they have a lot more CMBS debt. 
Um, Cred IQ takes basically that that CMBS number from TREP, and they stack in a whole bunch of other types of things that they consider to be in distress. So it's a, a little bit more qualified, and they, they kind of add to the mix a little bit, which is why they have higher distress numbers than what we're seeing with TREP. Uh, so basically, we're looking at uh, industrial, no distress, basically none. Apartment, very low, depending on how, you, how you're adding it up. But generally speaking, from a historical standpoint, we, we had much greater distress in apartments during the COVID uh, pandemic. And it was an order of magnitude higher. I mean, the, we were seeing numbers closer to 20% uh, in the financial crisis. So overall distress level for multifamily is, is still very low. You can see the other property types there, hotel, retail, office. Again, a little higher but this is not problem. This is not a problem level of distress. Historically speaking, we're in our target range. And then uh, there's another data source out there. It's called Atom, A-T-T-O-M. Mm -hmm. They track commercial real estate foreclosures. This is their own tracking system. Their data only goes back to 2014. We've used it uh, in the past. And you can see the foreclosures, total foreclosures is up significantly for commercial real estate. Uh, but it's still not as high as it was in 2014, 2015, which was not a bad year. So if you go back and you rewind to 2010, it, it's, you know, it's an order of magnitude greater than what we had in 2014. So again, we keep hearing about how much these numbers are increasing, percentage increase, which is true, but it's been at historically low levels for the last five to seven years. I mean, it's been abnormally low for the last several years. So we see this quote unquote spike. It's really just moving up into a normal range. And, uh, and in fact, I think foreclosures were suppressed during the pandemic. Um, nobody was foreclosing on any real estate during the pandemic. So foreclosure rates were very low and, and now we're moving back into normal. So the long and short of this is, don't get freaked out by the headlines. And yeah. if you're an opportunistic investor, it's not as good as it sounds uh, from that side either. So yeah. Um, yeah, looking for the deals, you might be waiting for a while. Yeah, it really, honestly, it, I would not be building my strategy around going out and finding distressed property unless I'm looking specifically for office buildings or unless I have a conduit to buy notes from the from banks that may be trying to get rid of some stuff that they think is at risk and where I plan on actually buying the note and then foreclosing on the property myself. Um, those are the places where most of the of the foreclosure, quote unquote foreclosure or, or opportunistic capital, that's where they're going to find their deals. It's it's a limited pool. Some of the stuff's going to get bid up. I don't think it's, you know, especially the smaller or the more casual investor who doesn't have those relationships, that's not a game to play in. It's just really going to be thin. Okay. And so I'm on the delinquency rate. That's low as well. Yeah, the CMBS. And, and I, I already spoke to this for the most Sorry. part. Basically... CMBS delinquency. And the reason I use CMBS is because it's the only one that's reported, right? The banks don't come out and say, hey, here's how many of our loans are delinquent. They don't report that number. And even the Mortgage Bankers Association has no information or, or insight into this. There's no transparency. Uh, but CMBS, because it's publicly traded debt, uh, actually reports their delinquency rates. Uh, so it's pretty much the only real data, hard data that we can look at. And and as long as you're using it as a proxy for the market, it's it's reasonably good. And basically what it's saying is distress currently is not high. It is basically on par with everything we saw in 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18. We're probably just fine. Awesome. Okay. So we'll we'll just maybe go through this section pretty quickly since we're at the hour, um, national apartment vacancy rate on the rise amid record completions. That's, yeah. 
Yeah, we were talking about that at the very beginning of the call uh, when when I jumped in. Uh, basically, completions are at a record high. It's the greatest we've seen since basically the early 80s. Uh, during the early 80s, when the baby boomers were coming of age and moving out on their own, we had this huge spike of construction. Uh, and now we're seeing the same thing, and but this time it's for the millennials. So this was, was this is no surprise. But the the thing is, is that this tends to be very concentrated. Actually, if we if we look at the next slide, it lists out where we are with the number of completions and the inventory growth by the top ten metros. And so. We're having huge completions. We're getting an overhang here. We're oversupplying the market over the short term. But when you look at inventory growth, you look at uh, which ones are the fastest growing. You see, you know, Austin, Phoenix, uh, Denver, Charlotte, Dallas. Okay, these are all markets with very strong employment growth and very good population growth. So even though we're starting to see the uh, wave of construction overload the market over the short term. It's doing it in markets to make sense, where the demand drivers are going to continue to grow. We're going to absorb all of this excess inventory over time. This is not, again, it's a short-term problem, not a long-term problem. And if we look at the next slide, which talks about demographics, this is the cornerstone. Essentially, we have 72.5 million millennials out there. Most of them are, uh, are, are out there, but not all of them are living on their own yet. Household formation has been very choppy since the pandemic. And so there is pent up demand from the millennial generation that is yet to materialize. Uh, somewhere we're estimating somewhere in the neighborhood of three million households that have yet to material materialize from the millennial generation, not to even to mention Gen Z or Gen A, uh, Gen Alpha, which come behind them. So, at the end of the day, we still have a housing shortage between three and five million. I've seen numbers as high as seven million on these estimates, yeah. but yeah. Uh, basically, we have a, a housing shortage nationally. That number hasn't come down, incidentally. Even though we're building record numbers of apartments, the housing shortage hasn't changed because of population growth. So at the end of the day, even though we're building record numbers of new apartment units, at the end of the day, we're still going to need all of those and many, many more. And that's part of why multifamily is such a strong opportunity over the long term is because you have the housing demand. And also the single family builders are not keeping up with the market. They're actually restricting their, their uh, construction. They're shrinking their construction compared to last year because of the cost of capital. Uh, associated with building because of the uh, slowed uh, housing transaction market. Uh, we're just not seeing the number of housing units being constructed that we need. Uh, and that kind of carries us into the next couple of slides, which shows uh, your your home prices at a record high, 408,000 is the median for the US. Uh, existing home sales uh, still very, very soft because there's a limited number of inventory and because there's a limited number of people who can qualify for a mortgage, uh, which is the next slide. Um, in a nutshell, home payments on a medium priced home are basically at a record high. And even though we catch all these headlines about how apartment rents have gone up so much, they haven't gone up anywhere near what home prices have. And as a result, the spread between the average rent and the payment on a medium price home has widened out to pretty much its widest level on record. About $1,300 uh, per month is the differential between uh, your estimated home payment on a medium priced home relative to the average apartment rent in the United States. And that is a huge barrier to entry for people to transition from renting to owning. And the other side of it is uh, over here on the right, based on the Freddie Mac underwriting criteria for a home loan, 
only 26% of households in the United States can qualify, can just qualify for a mortgage on a median priced home. So the loss of renters from, uh, from multifamily units into home ownership is down dramatically, and I expect it to stay uh, at a reduced level uh, for a prolonged period. And Kathy, that's part of why that built-to-rent single-family home model uh, that you were talking about earlier makes so much sense because people aren't going to be able to buy a home. Unfortunately, yeah. home ownership, the American dream of home ownership is being challenged right now. And, uh, but people still want the quality of a single family home to live in. And so they're going to rent it instead because they can't make that home payment. They're not yeah. able to make that gap and they're not able to get the mortgage. Absolutely. So expect more demand for single family rentals and, and apartment rentals yes uh, that is that is our that's our forecast and and that's what we believe i think that that uh shortage of housing is going to be a long-term issue uh across the united states yeah um yeah and i'm on the insurance page for apartments it's it's uh, definitely getting harder to make the numbers work with the costs going up yeah that's 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 been a big issue uh, literally every time I go to the National Multi Housing Council conference, uh, it's basically the largest multifamily conference of the year. Um, this is the number one issue for the last two years, uh, and and you know insurance costs since uh, the end of 21. So basically over the last two two and a half years, uh, insurance costs are up 76 percent. This is a huge huge increase. It looked like it was starting to flatten out but it's jumping again. A big piece of this is the incidence of natural disasters. This is where I'm talking about hurricanes. And we just, again, we had Hurricane Barrel, uh, which is a very early hurricane uh, to cause as much damage as it did. Uh, and we're looking at the potential for a very severe hurricane season across the Gulf uh, and across Florida. And so natural disasters, that and wildfires, especially in the West, uh, have been really impacting the insurance industry, and they've pushed rates up dramatically. A uh, really big problem in Florida. A lot of the, of the insurance companies just flat out pulled out of California and Florida, and, and so it's made those insurance costs really problematic. Uh, as an investor, this is something that has become a major issue. Um, the only only a handful of investors that I know of have been able to sidestep this, and that's because they're insuring on a portfolio basis, and they have a lot of of uh, properties in low risk areas, uh, you know, Midwest, uh, Phoenix, other cities where you have low incidence of natural disasters. If the weight of the portfolio is in those types of markets, then you know the occasional uh, apartment building or whatever in Jacksonville or Miami or Houston, which would normally have an enormous insurance rate, uh, is you know they're able to do that and break that down on a portfolio basis. But basically insurance costs are up dramatically, uh, especially in, in uh, Florida and California. And then I think Texas is probably in that number three slot uh, for, for rate hikes, but it's affecting everybody. Even, even in the low risk markets there, you're seeing increased in, in insurance costs as the, as the insurance companies defray that risk across multiple markets. Yeah, you so, know, and some of the, the newer builds and, and our single family, we're not uh, we're not really seeing the problem because they're built to, you know, different standard. But obviously, older or older buildings, uh, perhaps, are going to be tougher to to insure. I, I did hear that even with the newer build that are built to uh, the newer standards that resist hurricanes or other natural disasters, uh, shop the insurance early. Because uh, even in some of those cases, the the, the simple the simple fact is so many insurance uh, underwriters have stepped out of some local areas, 
mm-hmm. that there is just one or two insurance companies out there and they're charging a premium. And even though you're at the new standards and even though you're more resistant, they're saying, look, you don't have a choice. We're just going to, this is what we're going to charge you. And we don't care if you sign up or not. Yeah. So be careful. Yeah. All right. Well, as a result, um, of course, uh, apartment transactions are down. <laughs> so, so you know, th- this is a big function of 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 two things. First of all, 2021 and 2022 shot through the roof. Everybody was buying apartments. If they could get an apartment, they wanted to buy an apartment. There was a lot of liquidity. There was a lot of capital. We were coming out of the pandemic. The apartment sector outperformed expectations. The cost of capital fell to nothing, and and basically, you know. Prices shot through the roof and transaction activity went through the roof with it. Those were not normal years. Those were abnormally active years for commercial real estate and and specifically for apartments. Since then, as the interest rates shot up in 2022-23, uh, the transaction activity fell off. It was it was very difficult to make a, a deal pencil. Uh, you know, sometimes you're you're it's such a negative leverage number. You just can't even you can't make it. You can't make sense of it no matter what. But in terms of the activity levels, I kind of have decided that you know 2014 through 2019 was quote unquote normal activity levels, and we're about 40% shy of that at this point. Uh, We are seeing uh, the market turn, literally as we speak. We're seeing more listing activity coming in. We're seeing more deals go under contract. We're seeing the bid-ask spreads start to tighten. We're starting to see the flow of capital coming back into the market. We see, you know, we saw a Blackstone deal coming through, a KKR. These are major institutions that are starting to get back into the multifamily market, uh, which is a sign that we are coming into a turning point. And uh, if the Fed comes through with their rate cuts in September and then we get a second one by the end of the year, uh, I do envision that the transaction flow is going to move up back into the normal range and maybe even a little bit better than that in 2025. It takes time to prime the pump. It takes time for people, for deals to get, you know, put under contract and then to go through the, the, the process of, of evaluating these assets and, and, and making sure that everything's okay and then getting them closed. So we probably won't see a big movement in the numbers through the remainder of 2024. But we are seeing the market turn, and going into 2025, we should see an acceleration of transaction velocity. Okay. Um, and then we probably we probably need to wrap up pretty soon. Most of our listeners are more on the single family side, so. Uh, but let's take a look at at this slide on cap rates trending up. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, we see the, we, the, we've seen the cap rates trend up. Uh, we see the momentum going there. We see. Um, uh, that spread has tightened, um, but we are seeing the 10-year treasury come down. We're seeing those uh, interest rates start to come down and tighten up. Um, looking forward into 2025, uh, you know, where where do we expect uh, the treasury rates? It's, it's very difficult to predict, but most of the people I'm following are saying somewhere around 4%. Okay, those those two dot something, you know, or, or even, you know, low threes, those interest rates are gone. Uh, most, most people will say we're not going to get back down there again. Um, but we did see that rise in, in the, the cap rates and, and open that spread up a little bit. Rates will come down a little bit. I think that's going to help narrow the expectation gap between buyers and sellers. And we see the deal flow start to move again. I do not expect that those cap rates are going to go up anymore. I think we're already done with that. We're already seeing it in the data. I think that they there may be some cap rate compression as we go forward and as the capital comes back into the multifamily market. So uh, I think that those interest rates uh, are are going to come down a little bit, but the but the yields and the pricing on these things are are not going to um, shift too much more. Single family 
One of the things, a lot of people believe that single family home prices were going to come down. Uh, and again, I went back, I watched our, our prior, our last two conversations where we, in both of them, we said that we don't expect that to happen. And, and Kathy, you and I were both right on that. Yeah. They have not come down. And I do not expect that they will. The housing yeah. shortage will not allow those prices to come down. The even though only 25% uh, can qualify for a loan, there is still income. People are still, wage growth is outpacing uh, valuation growth and, and cost growth. So people will be able to buy homes. There are people out there who are still going to buy homes. There is a shortage of inventory. There's a lot of the resale inventory that's locked in. The builders have pulled back on their construction. So uh, again, I do not expect home prices to come down on a macro basis. There could be a market here and there where things come down, but I don't think that this is going to be a broad base uh, uh, reduction in values. And I think that basically as we look forward, uh, your biggest challenge when it comes to single family is going to be that the rent growth has not kept up with the appreciation. So, in other words, it's hard to get these things to cash flow, and it's hard for the, to get them to print uh, to to make sense they, to pencil out uh, unless you put a very large down payment. So these well, are uh, rate down, yeah. Well, the rate again. I don't think the rates are going to come down very much. So, no, I mean, if you, can, if you can buy down the rate or have the builder. Yeah, buy yeah. Down. And that's what the yeah. builders are doing. In order to move inventory, the, the builders are actually buying down the rates for the buyers. Uh, yeah. And that's how they're selling off houses. But, uh, again, these, these, these are, the, these are going to be real challenges. Many, many markets are not going to pencil uh, or unless you have a down payment or you buy down that rate. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, I'm on a cap rate slide again. Which which one? Maybe you cap are. Cap treasure. Yeah, I think you already did that. So now, um, supply and demand on construction and vacancy trends. Yeah, I just I threw in a lot of other property types. Uh, okay. Just very very. You know, I'll touch very briefly on some of the other popular types of uh, real estate. Uh, in a nutshell, retail is performing better than it has in the last 25 years. Uh, there's no construction. The vacancy rate is at a record low. The rent growth is north of 3%, uh, especially for like a grocery anchor, strip center. Uh, those are in high demand right now. Wow. Industrial had record levels of completions. Uh, that drove up the vacancy rate. The large, very large uh, industrial properties, especially in core markets um, like Dallas, Atlanta, Chicago, Phoenix, Houston, the Inland Empire, those giant big box is what got hit, especially in those six markets. Uh, smaller infill industrial properties, uh, logistics uh, centers, those are doing very well. They're hard to get. They're holding values. Their vacancy rates are low. That is the niche within industrial that is, is holding up. Office, we talked about earlier, you have 17.9, basically a record high vacancy rate for office. That's very heavily weighted to the urban core, older, large office towers. You get into smaller, uh, smaller, newer suburban office. Those are actually performing much better. The vacancy rate on those is about 11%, but they're very difficult to finance. And basically, mm -hmm. if the word office appears anywhere in the label uh, of the package, then you're going to have a hard time financing it. Um, unless you put a very large down payment again, uh, or you have a very good relationship with your bank. The self-storage, um, during the pandemic, the vacancy rate on self-storage basically fell like a rock. Everybody needed self-storage. We've gotten through that. We're seeing a, a new wave of development that's pushing that vacancy rate back up. Uh, so self-storage, I put in a category of, you gotta know the market, you gotta know that 
property on that street corner in that metro and really understand it. Uh, there can be some fantastic opportunities and there can be some stuff that faces some real risk ahead. So that's on a deal by deal basis as you look around the country. For sure. Yeah. That craze might be, you know, not what it was a few years ago. Okay. I'm on the colorful slide. <laughs> that just breaks out all the transactions by uh, property type. It's basically very reflective of what we saw with the apartment transaction velocity. Uh, but in this case, we, we broke it out into the different property types. Uh, basically, what we're seeing right now is industrial transaction velocity tended to hold up better. Same with retail uh, relative to the peak of the market. Uh, Self-storage held up pretty well. But your your office transaction velocity is down dramatically, uh, and so is multifamily. So uh, those ones uh, are where we saw the the steeper declines in in transaction activity. Uh, but it basically holds true with what we were talking about earlier. Perfect. Okay, and uh, sales price trends. Yeah, and you got to take this with a grain of salt. Remember, if I take every retail center that sold uh, in, in you know in the last year, and I take the average price, I get two seventy three, right? But that doesn't mean that that is what every retail center is priced at. Uh, so take it with a grain of salt. The trend is more valuable than the actual number. We saw that in twenty twenty three, prices pretty much uh, for everything but industrial uh, came down. We've seen a, a little bit of a bounce back with retail. Uh, I think office, uh, I don't put a lot of credence in that office number at 223. I would say that there's still some bumpiness out there. It depends on the yeah. mix of properties that sell. Again, you have markets like Miami and Las Vegas where the vacancy rate in office is now below where it was before the pandemic. By the same token, you have a market like San Francisco where the vacancy rate has gone up by an order of magnitude it is dramatically higher. So market by market, but in general, you know, unless you really know the office market, I wouldn't be playing there. And then self storage, we've seen those values. They peaked in 2022 as we were coming out of the pandemic because the vacancy was at a record low and the rents were at a record high. So those values really, really peaked in 2022. We've seen them come down since. In addition, uh, rent trends have become more opaque for self-storage as the REITs have changed their business model. Street rates are, 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 are becoming much more difficult to, to track and stabilized rates um, are, are much different. But uh, yeah, self-storage is in a maturation process that's making it a little bit more difficult to play there. All right. I'm going to go ahead and skip some of these slides. I think you you mentioned that. I think there's only that. two left. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and again, I think the one with the, the blue and the orange, the U.S. cap rates by property type, I think this is just shows you compared to 2019, here's how much the cap rate has gone up for each of the property types. And again, self-storage, you have to remember that there was a dip in the middle, right? That, that cap rate mm -hmm. went from 6.2 down to like 5.5, five, and now it's back up to 5.8. So uh, there, there's a, a trough in the center there somewhere. But in general, cap rates have gone up, varies by property type, it varies by location, it varies by metro. Uh, but this just gives you a feel for the pricing change that we've seen over the last uh, couple of years uh, and, and where we are today. So the next slide I don't think we need to address. It kind of is re, it's just a bigger version of what we've already seen. But uh, yeah. I did want to bring up that comparison to 2019 by property type. Fabulous. So much, so much um, information. Well, I'm just going to just very quickly because it's 2.30 and I don't want to take more of your time, but um, quick, quick question. Um, do you have a prediction for the stock market? Do you think that's going to slow down as we see? <laughs> it's hard. That's, that's not your field, I know. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, the stock market is more volatile. It moves for different reasons. There's a lot more forces at play 
and it tends to move more quickly one direction or another, uh, which is why I love real estate, right? It's a much more predictable uh, investment, uh, and, it, and it's slower moving. So guys like me can keep track of it and, and stay up to speed. Stock market is going to be driven by sentiment. It's going to be driven by flow of capital. Uh, I think it's going to be influenced by the election a lot more than the real estate market is. Uh, so I, I, I really can't honestly tell you uh, wh where I see that going. I, I don't know. A lot has changed in the last few days. So we'll have to wait and see on that one. <laughs> okay. All right, John. Thank you so much again. Uh, this is John Chang from uh, Marcus and Millichap. He obviously specializes in commercial real estate, but you know we're hearing so many crazy headlines as he explained in the beginning if you didn't see the beginning be sure to watch the replay uh do, do not trust those scary headlines get the real data so john we love having you here thank you so much for taking this extra half hour to um to to go through these slides really appreciate it oh it's my pleasure sorry about the technical challenges at the beginning but uh we'll get it all figured out for next time yeah absolutely still you know just so appreciative all right have a great uh, rest of your day everyone thank you Take care. Bye-bye.